National Institute for Digital Learning, and it's all marked in around there on um, we work there as well. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, very much. Yes. 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 Job at DCU, and as you can probably tell, I'm not from around these parts. Um, some of you, it's a pretty intimate audience, so I guess I'll just reveal the fact that I'm not an Australian, as some people might like to think. I am from down under, but um, I'm actually from New Zealand, and uh, that's just what some of my previous colleagues did. Acknowledging. Uh, just to give a little bit of credibility because it's been a while since I've been at a conference that perhaps has a much stronger uh, compulsory schooling sector or first and second level focus and uh, in the last decade my interests have more been at the third level of higher education but I think it's really important when we're talking about our national strategy that there are interfaces between all the sectors, a seamless um, involvement or in connection about digital learning. Uh, I used to edit the journal Computers in New Zealand Schools. It still is published, so it's on an online journal now if anyone is wanting to just do a Google search and have a look. It used to be a very important publication. I titled this uh, with a subtitle of uh, Perspective from the Other Side, and there's a little bit of a, a number of ways that can be read. Firstly, uh, when we're down under, sometimes we're sort of on the underside, as you can see. Uh, but of course the topic of what I'm wanting to talk about today is MOOCs and uh, I suppose there's hardly anyone now that hasn't heard of the MOOC movement and I want to give a little example from my own experience and tell a bit of a story and narrative wrapped around that experience with a deeper message I think. So I won't linger on that too long other than say I just want to start with a quick pop quiz and then ask you two questions really. Um, with one question with two answers. So, what are the two things that cows are good for? Don't be shy. Milk. Very good. And just as an aside, Fonterra is a New Zealand company. It's the biggest dairy company in the world. Um, what's the second thing that cows are really good for? Um, they're probably good for several things, but this is a particular thing they're very good at. I didn't pick up your... Not quite. Well, it's close. It's close. I think close. Not, not good enough for the cigar, but close enough. Um, they produce a lot of BS. Well, actually, cows don't. Bulls do. But I think you know what I mean. And uh, the reason I sort of got this slide is because when I come to conferences about new technologies in education, regardless of what level they're on, I usually find a lot of BS. And I really would like to think that as teachers and educators, we increasingly refine our BS detectors. Um, my antennae go off when I hear certain words. And sometimes, going back, if I'm honest, 15 years ago, even 20 years ago, I may have been guilty of those sorts of observations, comments myself. And it's a journey. A journey, I guess, I like to use this slide here. It's not particularly well empirically grounded, but I think it tells an interesting message. So first and foremost, when we're talking about new technologies in any educational institution, whether it be a school, an early childhood centre, or a large university, there are going to be competing mindsets. And so simplistically, these mindsets are just described as the boosters, those who are just avid lovers of technology, for want of a better way of putting it. The de-schoolers who see ways in which new technologies can actually challenge fundamentally the structures of the schooling systems, or education system we have. Then you've got the doomsters. Now they're probably not at this conference, but I bet you know some in your work settings. These are the people who say, why should I change? I've always taught the way I have, and this new technology is just another fad. And then what I would argue, limited empirical evidence, a little bit from my own New Zealand experience, the largest group, which I've described as the Toolsters. This is the group that mostly makes up the education profession. And you may be guilty, because I have been guilty of saying this even just recently. It's not the technology that's important, it's just the tool. It's how you use it. There's some 
logic and I have some empathy for that view, but I think it's a very dangerous view. This is not just a tool. A tool, and there was a slide last night, the tech, tech talk, um, from Marshall McLuhan, which talked about we create the technology and then the technology shapes us. So what I'm really keen to do in the work that um, I've got ahead of me and the team that we only have at DCU and beyond is creating more critically thinking and reflective educators in the middle. And I have the yin and yang because the good and the bad are interwoven when we talk about new technologies. I can get a little bit more theoretical and overlay it with some different perspectives and if I want to be really dichotomous about it, there's a sort of technocratic dream group and then there's those who subscribe to more the technocratic nightmare or social determinism and technological determinism. That's probably a little more than I might have to say. I think the essence of what I'm trying to convey is, I like this quote from Shakespeare, the web of our life is a mingled yarn of good and ill together. And that's what we need to unpack because the discourse, the language around the use of new technologies in education is wrapped up in all sorts of competing perspectives and theories. And it's not easy to be pure. In fact, it's not a pure activity that we're engaged in, as the story I hope I'm going to tell unpacks. Just recently, three books that I'm uh, suggesting that you should read. I'm scanning my way through at the moment, two of them. Um, one, the middle one there by Rick Peters is a fully online book, so I haven't put the websites there, but I'm sure a Google search will find those for you. Uh, these slides are all on slides here, share, I have a link right at the end if you follow up. The other two, um, one by Neil Selwyn, many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with Neil Selwyn, who now lives and works at Monash University in Australia, and the book on the far side is The Politics of Education and Technology, just recently out, edited book by Selwyn and Kerry Faser. Very, very good reads. Not necessarily many handy hits for educators though. So what I want to cover in the main, remaining time, I've got four things, and this is really a little bit of my journey. Uh, I'll try to contextualise it as much as I can, but maybe that'll be the lunchtime conversations for the Irish setting. What is Open to Study? What did Massey University, where I was from, do in joining Open to Study? How do we develop these courses and what do we learn from the experience where there may be some lessons? Now, I've outlined that I like to position myself as a critic, but when someone in the university government body comes up and asks you, what is the university doing about MOOCs? Very difficult to sort of say nothing. So you have to do something. And this is the lesson about how this is a very messy activity. Um, whilst one's principles and one's integrity might say MOOCs, they're just the next bad or they're just following very traditional behaviourist views of learning, videos we've used those since the 50s, so on and so forth. Um, that's not acceptable in a political context. And all schools are highly political environments requiring compromise. So um, I've led this initiative up until recently at Massey University and I'll give you a little bit of a taste of it. Um, I guess what we were trying to avoid, my personal um, attempt was, in terms of my own integrity, was to avoid this other acronym, FOMO, which to my mind characterises most new technologies, people who advocate them, the fear of missing out. In other words, chasing the next technological rainbow, the technology chaser, not the pedagogical chaser. Um, and also, if I want to go at a very deeper level, just to give you a sense of my own perspective on the role that technology and some of these new initiatives are, are having, I really think the MOOC is very deeply in, intertwined with the globalisation movement, which is both good and bad, neoliberalism, which is a particular view of economic theory that dominates a lot of Western countries at the moment, the expansion of digital capitalism, because the MOOC is the ultimate of the free market, and then um, the decline of influence of the nation state, uh, state's ability to implement policies that, uh, and even curriculum now that address local needs rather than global ones. Perhaps global is where we need to focus. So that's a little bit of my perspective, but nonetheless, um, here I am leading this Open to Study initiative. What is Open to Study? Open to Study is the Australasian version of uh, FutureLearn, if you've heard of FutureLearn out of the UK. It's another MOOC platform. It doesn't often get mentioned in, when you're hearing about Coursera and FutureLearn and EdTech, uh, edX, 
Uh, but it's actually quite sizeable and has a number of uh, partners outside of Australasia, several in China, uh, in the Middle East, uh, and so forth. Things grow. I may now um, flick out from the PowerPoint briefly because I want to show you a video and I couldn't get it to embed on this machine. But um, along the bottom there, you may see some of the partner universities that are part of Open the Study. Most of them are Australian based. One of the interesting initiatives, the political initiative at Massey, where I'm from in New Zealand, is we were the first university to embrace an enterprise-wide development of MOOCs for our country and had an exclusive arrangement. And that paid huge dividends politically in terms of marketing. Uh, not something I necessarily felt entirely comfortable with, but the reality is what we're dealing with. Let me just briefly see if I can minimise this to show you the video. Education should be accessible for everyone. The traveller. The CEO. The tech. The job seeker. With Open to Study, now it is. Open to Study provides free, high quality education online. How free? You won't pay a cent and there are no strings attached. It's backed by Open Universities Australia, who has been leading online learning for over 20 years. You can study subjects with real value, taught by academics and leading industry professionals who love to teach. Subjects range from food, nutrition and your health, strategic management and introduction to nursing. We're adding new... It's probably enough to give you a sense of... Um, so, back into here. So, um, why did Massey University choose to go and open the study? I've already given you a sense that this is a political decision as much as a pedagogical one. But there are really three main reasons that I want to um, briefly explore. First and foremost, as I've given you a pretty good insight into the university wanted to enhance its reputation, profile its signature platform is a term that was used, the areas in which it had truly world-class expertise and then promote the university to international students. A little known fact about New Zealand is that in terms of export income, education is our third largest export income earner. Tourism, sorry, agriculture, tourism, education. Australia is their fourth biggest because they have mining minerals. Um, so it's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. The second suite of reasons were much more committed, I think, to sort of student success, I guess I would describe it. Um, there is evidence emerging, empirical literature emerging, to show that MOOCs are playing a role in helping students to succeed in two ways. One, by helping prospective university or third level students choose the right course. So these might be secondary level students who are thinking about university study and they're able to get a better sense of what the discipline really involves. The second part is, uh, and particularly at the university, I've come from where online learning, blended learning was just second nature to everything that was done. It was very important that, believe it or not, but secondary students and second chance or mature learners coming to study did not have, they were not digital natives as some of the literature tries to tell us, they did not have the level of skills that really were required to be an effective online learner. So there's evidence to show that MOOCs are starting to play a role there, but I think we have to treat that evidence with a grain of salt. The third set of reasons really relates to um, our ability, first and foremost, in this particular platform as a foundation member, we were able to shape the design and development of the platform, which was based on Moodle and Drupal. Quite a substantial amount of money had went into it. And then most importantly, and really the reason why I was passionate about engaging my time in this, was the opportunity to innovate. See, for me, it's one thing sitting on the sidelines and being a critic, as I've indicated previously, and perhaps even some of those books I shared with you as references. But unless you're on the inside exploring and innovating, I don't really believe you really understand opportunities, or perhaps the things that are not possible that are claimed. So that's kind of how we justified our involvement. Third thing then, what courses did we develop? Well, initially just three. And I've highlighted the first one in particular, agriculture and the world around us. 
Uh, partly this was very, very strategic because at Master University and the university rankings that dominate our life now in the university sector, uh, the university was ranked 19th in the world now in the area of agriculture. And given that there are over 10,000 universities, um, more than 10,000 universities, that's quite impressive. Um, so it was clearly aligned to showcase an area of world expertise. Emergency management is an area that the developing world is crying out for expertise in, and I'm sure those of you in Ireland um, trying to ensure that uh, Irish culture is retained will understand why we focused on indigenous cultures as a third topic. Very briefly, I just want to give you a taste of one of those. I must be just about out of time, so I can just come out again. That's uh, the agriculture course, um, and I'll briefly show you maybe 30 seconds worth of the videos. So I'll just come out. Hi, my name's Russ Tillman and I'll be taking this course on agriculture. I'm a Professor Emeritus at Massey University in New Zealand and my original area of expertise was soil science. And in the last 40 years I've been doing research and teaching students about the importance of soils um, in farming and about the impact that farming sometimes has on the wider environment. And in this course we'll be looking at how agriculture is practiced right around the world. And in doing this, we'll start by looking at the crucial role that agriculture plays in feeding the world's ever-growing population. And then we'll start to drill down and look at individual farms, the different types. That's probably enough to give you a taste. Uh, Russ was not the most fluent, as you can see, of people in front of the camera, and that's one of the lessons, of course, about the use of video and the education. So, um, what did we learn from this experience? First and foremost, I'm just going to give you three things. I'm keeping this a really simple sort of presentation. There are lots and lots of people who want to do these courses. Lots. And I'm sure you heard all the figures quoted from the millions with Coursera. We weren't quite into that category, but more than people coming from more than 200 countries. Second thing is, we learned a lot about student progression, student success. The success rates for the Open to Study courses were actually 60% of those who began the course. Now the averages for MOOCs are reported to be around 10%. I'm misrepresenting that slightly, that's 60% who began the course. Um, the real rate, if you take those who registered, was around 30%, which is still substantially more than most of the other MOOCs. We believe that's because of some of the pedagogical techniques that we implemented and shaped. Happy to talk more about those, but lots more to learn. And then lastly, um, keeping it simple, we learned a lot about the use of video. Now, um, personally, I think video is a passive transmissional technology, but in actual fact, we learned how it can be very highly engaging and interactive. And new techniques like using iPads and linking up to um, tables really engaging the learner. A lot more to learn in that space. So, in conclusion, I guess my time is probably up, and I'm giving you a very quick small report. Um, lazy conclusion, I use this slide quite often because I know my time is up, and I haven't really got anything particularly earth-shattering to say. I think the MOOC is a conversation still in progress, and um, it's an innovation that we should be dab dabbling with in order to learn more. But if I want to, bit of time and check in finish my metaphor of the other side. Um, MOOCs may represent an idea, but only the cow knows. Um, of course, the cow itself might be a metaphor. You can only build the cow so long, and then you're left holding the pail. That's one of the other lessons about new technologies. There'll be a new fad, a new innovation. And then lastly, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free? Um, well, I guess there could be a reason why we want to pay for our education that's of a certain quality. But nonetheless, I hope what I've done is just started a conversation. I'm looking forward to my time in Ireland, and I'm looking forward to meeting people over lunch and the rest of the day. So hopefully there's something that we'll follow up. Slide share site here if you want to follow up the slides. Thank you very much. I'm not sure we have time for questions. Do we have a few questions? Okay, we do. Well, uh, one of the most uh, fundamental differences is that the MOOC only ran for one month. 
So some of the Coursera MOOCs run for effectively like a semester. Um, so the decision was made that we would package the material into four weeks. Each week constituted a module. So there were four modules. So there was quite a stringent recipe, if you like, which was extremely challenging for our academic staff who are not used to complying with a, a formula. But the lessons from that also was that there was some happy balance between giving our staff and scaffolding them more with a template of how to package their learning rather than just leaving them to it. But the most important one, I think, really was around the structure of the courses. So you've got a couple of yes, questions there. I think the first thing is we really need to understand, and we had a very clear perspective on this at the university I came from, but perhaps others didn't. The MOOC was simply, the courses were simply testers. They were not a full course. Um, and in addition to that, we realised that they could not be scaled. And that's a fundamental problem. I think I saw um, this challenge in Deidre's slide at the end about the ability to scale and sustain innovation. The effort that went into these three MOOCs wasn't a lot of money, human resource, just simply was not scalable. So one of the downsides, I think, and we don't know the answers, which is why we should be experimenting and innovating, is how are we now setting and changing the expectations of learners, particularly through the use of rich media, when they come for a real learning experience, if they're all real, I suppose, but for an experience that's credit earning, and we don't do that. We don't have all those videos and other things and present it in a way that's so slick as most of the MOOCs do. Um, that will be an interesting sort of mismatch to see in the future.